Michael Knight. Oh my God. So I am uh, positively filled up with gratitude, but I'm gonna save my particular thank yous until the end of my time, if that's okay, not to be weird. Um, for those very few of you who know my work, uh, I tend to write two long short stories or two short novels about lonely white people in which nothing much really happens, which is a big problem at moments like this. Um, so I'm gonna, so what I'm going to try to do is, um, how about this? What you're about to hear is the first half-ish edited down version of a short story from my collection, Evening Land. The short story is called Water and Oil. And it goes like this. Ooh, I don't know, should I wear these? I probably need them, but I hate looking up at the crowd and you're like a wall of blurry weirdness. I'm gonna try to go without. Water and Oil. None of this is true. All of this is true. I want to tell you about a boy in a boat on a nameless creek, about dawn reflected on the water, but so dim over the swamp that it failed to illuminate the spaces between the trees. The boy's name was Henry Rufus Bragg, and though he was 17 years old and would most likely have been offended by my description, there was, there was still enough boy about him that the word remains appropriate. He was handsome, but in an unfinished way, especially in summer when the sun freckled his nose and cheeks, blurring his features, a faint constellation, half a shade darker than his tan. Six foot three now and not through yet, his bones ached at night with growing pains. A late bloomer, his mother called him, the last of the model airplane builders, a tender boy, a quiet boy, an odd and earnest boy who, like the keeper of some lost art, memorized old knock-knock jokes and repeated them in his head when he was bored. He lived on the nameless creek with his mother and his father and his younger sister in a white house with long windows and plantation shutters, porches front and back, the only house in sight. The creek drained into Dog River, La Riviere aux Chiennes, on the original French settlers' maps. And here the boy, called Bragg by everyone who knew him, would nudge the throttle down, boat nosing upward before easing into a plane, spray hissing around the hull, often as not startling a sleeping eager into flight. At moments like those, racing toward the big houses with big wharves crowding both banks of the river, and away from the lush untidiness of the creek, the boy was washed with a feeling he could not have put into words, a kind of rising, something to do with youth and his own fluency behind the wheel and how well he knew and loved this place. 10 minutes to Dog River Bridge, then 40 more between the channel markers in Mobile Bay to Dolphin Island where the EPA had set up shop. I am writing, of course, about that recent season when the offshore oil rig Deepwater Horizon blew out in the Gulf and the bottom of the ocean sprang a leak. His father owned a marina where the boy had worked previous summers, scraping barnacles, painting hulls. Though he could have used the boy's help that summer more than most, he could see the hard times coming. His wife wanted to encourage her son's better instincts and neither of them wanted the children to worry, so they agreed to let him volunteer after school at first and then once school let out from morning until dusk. Because the boy had his own boat, a bearded Oregonian named Jinx McPhee put him to work patrolling the mouth of Mobile Bay, eyes peeled for signs of oil. Once he'd reported for duty, the boy charted a course back and forth from Fort Gaines to Fort Morgan, between which Admiral Farragut dammed the torpedoes at the tag end of the Civil War. He was careful to steer clear of the hulking tankers headed in and out of port, his wake fading, reconstituting itself, Willie Nelson twanging in his earbuds, summer stoking up with every hour. He chuckled periodically at the jokes he told himself. At noon, he veered in the direction of his father's marina to refill his tank with gas, charge a hamburger at the snack bar, and pass a few minutes in the presence of Dana Pint, 
the girl I should have known would be the first to break his heart. In order to entice sport fishermen and leisure craft, the boy's father hired pretty girls to man the snack bar and the bait shop and the gas pumps at his marina. They dressed in white shorts and fitted t-shirts with the marina logo across the breast. It should be noted that the boy had known dozens of these girls over the years, admired their tan legs and their ponytails, highlighted by hours in the sun. Dana Pint was different. She was too skinny for one thing, and her teeth were crooked. Her hair wasn't long enough for a ponytail. Most of the girls wore sneakers to avoid splinters on the dock, but Dana Pint went barefoot, her toes so nimble looking the boy imagined she could use them to pick up coins. The first thing she said to the boy that summer was, what are you looking at? Like a tough girl in some movie, he'd forgotten not to stare. She was pumping gas for a twin engine Riballo at the time, one hand on her hip, the boy perched halfway up the steps between the dock and the snack bar. He poked the last of a hamburger in his cheek and walked down to where she stood. I'm Bragg he said. He extended his hand. She didn't take it. I know who you are, she said. The boy was so unused to hostility. Life came so sweetly and easily to him that he hardly recognized the resistance in her posture and her tone. Any other summer, the dock would have been lined with boats of various sizes, marina girls tending their needs, but on this day there was only Dana Pint gassing the Riballo, rods craning up from their holders like insect legs, and the boy and his boat, a Boston whaler skiff, a gift from his father on his 15th birthday, tied to a pylon at the end of the dock, stern tailing out into the bay on a receding tide. Knock, knock, he said. I've got a boyfriend, she said. His name is Pat. You're supposed to say, who's there? I asked the boy once about his fondness for knock-knock jokes, and he said he liked how they were all the same but different, too, how words and names took on new meanings in the pattern. That may not be an exact quote, but it's close. I remember being struck by the ready astuteness of his reply as if he had wondered the same thing about himself. Dana Pint squinted at the boy, lips pursed, a mean and wary look. You're standing here in this heat, telling me a knock-knock joke? That's right. I say knock-knock. You say, who's there, she said. The boy said, orange. Just then, the gas pump clicked, tank full, and Dana Pint rattled the nozzle back into its slot. For a second or two, he believed she was going to let him finish the joke, but she brushed past him and on up the steps to the snack bar, splay-footed, legs so thin he could see inches of daylight between her thighs. When he wasn't patrolling the bay, the boy could be found in his basement lifting weights, bulking up for the last football season of his high school career. He played tackle on both sides of the ball or pulling his friends on an inner tube around Dog River, whipping his boat in tight, thrilling, centrifugal turns. And sometimes on Fridays, after he finished his rounds, he'd pass an hour or two with me. For longer than the boy had been alive, I'd lived on a houseboat in the slip I rented at his father's marina. Every Friday, I would buy a six pack at the snack bar and ice it down and boil whatever crabs I'd pulled up in my traps. The boy's father didn't mind him drinking a single beer in the company of an old man he trusted, his most loyal customer, a widower of 19 years, living on just enough pension to make rent on the slip. Occasionally, his father even joined us, but most Fridays it was just me and the boy in folding chairs on the aft deck of the Agnes Ray, named for my late wife, sipping cold, cold beer and tossing bread ends to the seagulls while we waited for the crabs to boil. He was such a polite boy that he indulged my questions about his life without complaint. What exactly was the EPA doing out on Dauphin Island, and did he think his team might make the playoffs in the fall, and was he making progress with any of those girls he pulled behind his boat? It was in this way that I happened upon his interest in Dana Pint. The trashy one, I said, the new girl. 
Mornings, I heard her boyfriend's souped-up Nissan whining like mosquitoes on the way to drop her off, saw his lips on her neck in the parking lot, his hands all over, the whole sordid business repeated at five o'clock. When I asked for her help at the marina, let's say I needed a bucket of crickets for my cane pole, she'd huff like working was a nuisance. The only reason she was hired in the first place was the boy's father had offset impending losses with wage cuts, and the usual marina girls could no longer afford the job. The boy said, I don't think she's trashy. His eyes were focused on some inward middle distance, his expression exactly as I pictured it as he scanned the water for oil from his boat. It was of no small concern to bear witness as he persevered with Dana Pint. Knock, knock, he'd say when he caught her by herself, and she'd just stare at him like he was simple, though the meanness and mistrust in her eyes began to fade. Once, while Dana Pint was hosing, hosing fish guts and sequins of white scales from the filleting station, the boy repeated his usual line, and she said, God damn it, who's there? <laughs> <clears throat> Al, he said. Al who? I'll give you a kiss, the boy said, if you open this door. Dana Pint let her mouth gape for a moment. How old are you, she said. He told her, she shook her head, if Pat caught you out here telling me corny jokes, he'd whip your ass. Then she spritzed him with the hose, a fine, cool mist, before turning the water on her bare feet, which must have been blazing on those hot planks, baked white and warped by the sun. In those first weeks after the spill, the evening news broadcast endless video shot from helicopters, rainbows of oil on the surface of the gulf, vast, murky swaths of it beneath, and though we understood that there was nothing to be gained from rubbernecking our misfortune, we couldn't turn it off, tracking the oil's progress as it drifted from the coast of Louisiana to the coast of Mississippi, ever closer, always closer, the ruined well pumping black gallons of it, black as a bad mood. The boy aspired to be vigilant, tireless. If oil invaded the bay, he aimed to be the one to spot it. But he worried some mornings that by then it would be too late, that it was already too late. Oil would be sucked out of the gulf and into the bay and into the estuary rivers that fed it, pulled still further on the tide into the nameless creek, darkening the water like a cloud shadow. On those mornings, he could feel something like panic beating in his veins. He tried to channel his apprehension into watchfulness, his eyes focused on the rolling surface of the bay, the bay iridescent with sunlight, but he could only maintain his concentration for so long before an image of Dana Pint would rise unbidden from the water like a mirage, skinny legs, crooked teeth, sunburned skin peeling on the knobs of her shoulders and the bridge of her nose and the knuckles of her toes. His worry evaporated like bow spray before these visions. And no matter how hard he tried to put them out of mind to focus on the task at hand, he couldn't stop picturing Dana Pint in his boat, smiling at him over her shoulder, pale hair roughed by the wind. The boy had, with great patience, plied enough information from her to assemble a vague portrait of her life. 19, junior college dropout, a watcher of television and a reader of magazines. She lived with another girl in one half of a duplex. She had no aspirations that he could tell. But she was angry and she was sad about what he did not know. The boy was not completely innocent. I'm sure there were other girls willing to submit to his fumblings. He could not have explained the intensity of his attraction to Dana Pint, that blissful ache that welled up in his chest at the sight of her barefooting across the dock, the feeling a distant cousin of nostalgia, as if he'd already won and loved and lost her. But I can tell you he was the kind of boy, as many of us were, drawn to damaged beauty. He wanted without realizing it, to rescue her. For her part, I suspect, Dana Pint wanted and did not want to be rescued, was both flattered and affronted by the nature of his admiration. Near the end of May, because there were no other boats in need of fuel just then, she filled the boy's tank for him while he was ordering lunch. Two days later, she let him buy her a hot dog and a Coke, but she only ate three bites before dropping the hot dog in the trash and lighting a cigarette. He did not remind her 
that his father prohibited smoking on the dock. No, not not jokes today, she said. I was just thinking, he said. About what? Maybe you'd like to go for a ride, he said, on my boat. Dana Pint took a last drag and flipped her cigarette toward the water. It landed just short of the edge, and the boy watched to be sure the breeze carried it over the side. I'm supposed to be working, she said. Not right now, he said, this weekend. There was a smear of mustard at the corner of her mouth, and without thinking, the boy went for it with his thumb, but she pulled away, wiped it herself with the heel of her hand, licked the mustard from her skin. The next day, EPA and Coast Guard men hung long booms across the mouth of the bay as a hedge against the oil, but Jinx the Oregonian told the boy they'd still need him to patrol in case the oil slipped past. The boy made his morning rounds with nausea tugging at his guts, though he'd never been seasick in his life. At noon, Dana Pint came out to meet him on the dock. Knock, knock, he said. She said, all right. He opened his mouth to say honeybee, but stopped himself just short. Instead, as if she was leading him toward a new kind of punchline, he said, all right, what? Six o'clock, she said, it won't be so hot out then, and we'll still have plenty of daylight. Saturday, you can pick me up right here. Honeybee, he said. Dana Pint did not smile often in the boy's experience. When she did, as now, she pressed her lips together to hide her crooked teeth, but the boy had come to recognize the amusement in her eyes, the way they crinkled into black lines, nearly shut, all squint and lashes, like curtains hiding light. Most nights, the boy built model airplanes in his room. From his ceiling, hung by a fishing line, dangled a spitfire, a phantom, a hornet, a falcon, a kingfisher, a dreamliner, a mustang, a messerschmitt, a henkel, a fokker, an airbus, airbus, a foxbat, a frogfoot, a 747, a tornado, a lancer, a camel, a nighthawk, a thunderjet, a panther, a lightning, a tomcat, a dauntless, a harriet, harrier, and a concord. So many planes, he told me once, that their wings ticked together in the breeze sighing through the screen. I'd have guessed the boy would have been more interested in boats, but he went on building planes, further evidence that we are enticed by that which is separate from our lives. He had started a P-61 Black Widow, but it remained half-finished on his desk, the engine cowling unattached as if it had landed there for repairs. The boy stretched out in bed, watching the plane sway above him, the air scented with marsh and model glue, his computer linked to an internet site offering round-the-clock footage of the deep water horizon billowing crude like black smoke into the gulf. A rapping at the door. Knock, knock. Who's there? said the boy. His father spilled a puddle of light in from the hall, one hand on the knob, one hand on the jam. Everything all right? Fine, the boy said. Awfully quiet up here. Just tired, the boy said. His father's eyes flicked to the computer, that ceaseless gush and bubble. I'm worried too, he said. He was not entirely off the mark. The boy was worried, but not about oil. For hours, he had been fretting over the options for his boat ride with Dana Pint. He considered Middle Bay Lighthouse, which was beautiful at sunset. Or they could anchor off of Gilliard Island, where the brown pelicans made their roost thriving again after near extinction, first because of hunting, their feathers had once been a popular adornment for women's hats, and then because of DDT. Now, according to Jinx the Oregonian, the EPA estimated more than 10,000 nests on the island, not just pelicans, but herons and skimmers, stilts and terns and rails snugged in among the bulrush. For a while, after his father shut the door and left him, the boy indulged a fantasy in which he pointed his boat due south and kept on motoring into the gulf until they ran out of gas. He imagined long days waiting for rescue with Dana Pint, nights desperate with stars, the way they might use their bodies to soothe each other's fear. I'm going to stop right there. <clears throat> I don't know where she is. Thank you, Leah Stewart. Thank you, Adam. Thank you, Gwen. Thanks to every single person on this incredible, remarkable staff. There's one right there, Ananda. 
thanks to Wyatt Prunny for inviting me back in 2018 and welcoming me into this terrific family. Thanks to Vanita Blackburn uh, and all of the students in our great workshop, how incredible the work has been, what a joy it's been to be with you guys, what an honor it is to be here, what an honor it is to share this podium with the inimitable Monica Yoon. Thank you so much, Michael. I could really just have kept listening to that all night and been perfectly happy. Um, and uh, thank you also for our late night porch chats, which I hope will continue. Um, and thank you, of course, to Leah and to Gwen and to Adam and to the staff, particularly the French House staff. Um, and um, and uh, to Nate, my uh, my conspirator, and to the rest of the faculty and fellows and scholars and participants and everyone who makes this a community that I'm so happy to be joining. Um, so uh, I think I will start with something that is brand new. Um, these are all going to be from my next book uh, called uh, From From, which is coming out in 2023. And this one I wrote about two weeks ago. Uh, so this will be the first public reading I've given in a long time and first time I'm reading a lot of these. Uh, this is a parable. Uh, I was kind of, I got kind of got interested in parables because they're so explicitly didactic, which you don't really get the chance to be anymore. Um, and uh, and um, and I'm interested in magpies. Magpies are one of the symbols of Korea. Um, gachi. Uh, and kachi, uh, magpie, and together are very similar words. Um, and the magpie is particularly interesting because in most Eastern traditions, uh, the magpie is considered a positive symbol in of good luck, and it's the opposite in the West. Um, parable of the magpie in the trap. A certain magpie was caught in a wire mesh trap, and the trap was small, and the magpie could not fly, neither could it stretch out its black wings. And the trap held no food, nor did it hold water. And the magpie was hungry and thirsty in the shadowless sun. And then the hunter came, and the magpie said, Hunter, you should release me from this trap, for I am no food for you, and my meat is stringy and foul in the mouth. But the hunter put food and water for the magpie in the trap. Then the hunter went away. And then the cold rains came, and the wind and the magpie huddled in the trap, and the magpie could not dry its feathers, nor was there any dry place for the magpie to rest its feet. And the hunter returned, and the magpie said, Hunter, you should release me from this trap, for you cannot sell my feathers, for my black feathers are not beautiful, and neither are they proof against the wind and rain. But the hunter placed a stick in, a, in the trap as a perch for the magpie, and placed a roof on the trap to shelter the magpie, and then the hunter went away. And the trap was on the ground, and the coming night was near, and the predators began to wake in the shadows of the woods, and therefore the magpie was afraid. And the hunter returned, and the magpie said, Hunter, you should release me from this trap, for I am no threat to you, nor do I prey upon your beasts, nor do I feed upon your gardens or your crops. But the hunter placed a larger trap around the smaller trap and turned to go away. And the magpie cried, Hunter, you must release me from this trap, for no animal preys on me. So therefore, I am not bait for any quarry you might wish to trap and kill. Now, for the first time, the hunter spoke and said, Magpie, others will not come for you to eat you. Others will come for you to attack you and to drive you from their lands. For know now, magpie, that you are not bait because you are wanted, but you are bait because you are hated. And it is because you are hated that therefore you are valuable to me. And the magpie had no answer, and then the hunter went away. Uh, that's actually based on um, a Larsen trap, which was invented in Denmark and subsequently banned in Denmark for its cruelty, but it's still the standard way to trap magpies uh, in Britain and the US. Um, maybe I'll read another one of these parables. Um, 
based on our lunch conversation uh, where we were talking about the mirror test. So this is, the magpie is the only bird that can pass the mirror test, uh, which is a test of self-recognition that uh, I think uh, dolphins, um, primates, and the magpie uh, can pass it. Parable of the magpie and the mirror. A certain scientist had a cage and took a magpie and put the magpie in the and put the magpie in the cage. And the magpie's head and neck were black, and black were its beak and eyes, but the breast and belly of the magpie were white as paper, and the scientist watched the magpie in the cage. And after a time, the scientist said, it is said that the magpie is the wisest of all birds. I will set a test for the magpie, and if the magpie pass the test, therefore will I know it is my equal. The scientist took a tall mirror, therefore, and placed the mirror in the cage and the scientists watched the magpie in the cage. The magpie in the cage looked at the magpie in the mirror. The magpie in the mirror looked at the magpie in the cage. And the scientists watched and wondered and said, how will I know whether the magpie in the cage sees that the magpie in the mirror is its own true self rather than another identical magpie? Because I cannot read the black lacquered eyes of the magpie, neither can I parse the jagged scribble of its voice. Therefore, will I mark the magpie and observe. If the magpie see the mark in the mirror, and if it remove the mark on its body, therefore shall I know the magpie knows its own true self, even as I know myself. And the scientist took, therefore, the magpie and placed a yellow sticker on the magpie's black neck and placed the yellow sticker so the magpie could not see it, except that the magpie see the yellow sticker on the magpie in the mirror and the scientists watched the magpie in the cage. And the magpie in the cage looked at the magpie in the mirror, and the magpie in the cage reached up with its black claw and tore off the yellow sticker and crushed it in his claw and let the crumpled sticker fall to the soiled newspaper at the bottom of the cage. And now the magpie spoke and said, scientist, I submitted when you placed me in the cage, and then I said the scientist therefore will know me as an equal. And scientists, I submitted when you placed a mirror in my cage, and then I said, this scientist, therefore, will know me as an equal. But now, scientist, you have marked me with a yellow sticker, and to this marking, I do not submit. But because I do not submit, you know, therefore, that I know myself, and you know me, therefore, to be your equal. So now, scientist, you shall release me from this cage. And the scientist said, not unkindly, for the scientist did not mean to be unkind. Not so, magpie, for you have known yourself in the mirror, and you have seen yourself marked with a yellow sticker, and you have torn the yellow sticker from your neck, and therefore you have passed the test by which I know you as an equal. But because you are an equal, you must be marked with a yellow sticker in order to leave this cage. Um, this is a poem in one sentence, this kind of you know, sort of based on, I've been doing a lot of reading on immigration and labor practice, so this should be pretty self-explanatory. Leave, as in leave from a tree, uh, and uh, leave as in the Brexit uh, immigration sense of leave. Leave. Because it is to create an acute angle, an angle shaped like a wedge, because it is to give birth to what you already know to be expendable after it has cleaned, after it has fed you, because you are enriched by even its deterioration, because the join might seem slender like a throat, because the bud might seem tender like a bud, but in this tenderness you do not share, you do not share anything because even the join is also a jam, a harbinger of scab, a rust red portal that shuts down what it depletes, that shuts out the obsolete, because you keep what is inside from seeping out, because you keep what is outside from slipping in, because in the singular and as a noun, you are a form of formal permission, as in why don't you make like a tree and And um, <clears throat> we've been talking a lot about Greek mythology, so I thought I would throw this one in there. Um, so this is based on um, Marcius. Marcius is a satyr who, um, the there are two legends around him. First, that um, Athena had developed this pipe 
Um, and then she looked in the mirror and saw that blowing the pipe made her unattractive, and so she threw the pipe away in disgust. And Marcius, the satyr, comes and picks up this pipe and is very pleased with his playing on the pipe, uh, so he challenges Apollo uh, to a duel, which is not a good thing to do. And, um, and, um, and the, uh, the prize of the duel is that whoever wins gets to do whatever they want to the loser. And so after uh, Apollo wins the duel, um, he has um, Marcius flayed and make, uh, alive and makes his skin into a wineskin. And Marcius become, is a very interesting fig figure. I've been thinking a lot about the nationalist function of myth, uh, particularly in the last four or five years, say, and, um, and in particular, the nationalist function of Greek myth, um, because I'm a total Greek mythology nerd. And uh, Marcius is interesting in that regard because he comes from Phrygia, which is in present-day Asian Turkey. And, um, and I think a lot of the myths around satyrs are about this kind of Greekness defining itself at the expense of Asianness, which is defined as the wild, which is defined as the barbaric, the untamed, often the drunk. Um, and um, Marcius, after Greece in the Roman Republic, becomes this symbol of anti-tyranny and anti-imperialism. Um, so, kind of fun. Marcia, uh, this is present-day Marcius. Um, Marcius after. Dust loves me now, along with leaflets, plastic bags, anything unattached, anything looking for somewhere to stop, something to emblazon. Too painful to brush them off, the day's adhesions, too much a reenactment. I float in my tub of blood-warm water, element of indecision, if only it could be my habitat, if only the saw-toothed air didn't insist on its own uninterrupted necessity. I hate it, but lacking skin, I've lost my capacity for scorn. That was my failing, not excess of pride, but that stooping to pick up their accoutrements as if emulation could engender equality. I stain everything I touch. It all stains me. My raw surface is an unlidded eye. Each stimulus its own white hot knife, but why would I submit to be resheathed? To lessen pain? What used to distinguish me is already defeated. Limp trophy flag of conquest. Now I could be like them if I chose. But the acidulated rain imposes a least common denominator democracy. It scours away the pigments they used to humanize their marmorial self-regard. Their eyes gone dull as the calluses I would rather suffer forever than become. Okay, so this next one is a doozy. It is long. Um, it is, um, so uh, several of you know this poem that I wrote uh, called uh, Study of Two Figures, Pasifai Sado, uh, which is based on two figures, one from Greek mythology, and then the relevant one here is Prince Sado, who is from Korean history. Uh, he is a 17th, 18th century Korean prince. He was the crown prince. And so what happens with Sado is he's the crown prince. He marries uh, this woman named Lady Hyegyong. Uh, they, give, they have an heir, um, you know, the grandson of the king. And then Sado becomes insane. He becomes homicidally insane. And um, he rapes and kills probably 100 courtiers or so. Um, and because he is the crown prince, his body is sacrosanct. There's very little that anyone can do about the situation, including the king, um, because the king is kind of constrained. If he has Sado killed, then that will taint the succession so that the grandson will also be excluded from succeeding. There will be no heir. Uh, similarly for, you know, declaring him insane, other possibilities. And so what um, the king does is um, on a July day in Seoul, he orders a rice chest to be brought. Rice chest is just what it sounds like. It's a big box, holds rice made of wood. It's about maybe four feet by four feet by three feet. Um, and he orders Sado to apologize, which Sado does. He orders Sado to get into the rice chest, which he does. Um, 
King orders it closed. Uh, for some reason, it has grass put on the lid. Um, and then about eight days later, Sato dies. Um, so as I said, um, I wrote this longish poem um, called, you know, Study of Two Figures. And this rice chest was in it. And then I thought, you know, I'm not done with the rice chest. So I kind of did what I did in my lecture. I took this detail, study, detail of the rice chest, and I made it into a poem that turns out to be even longer than the original. So um, <clears throat> that's where we are. I will need water. You may need water. Um, detail of the rice chest. In the 2015 Korean film, The Throne, the rice chest sits in the center of the vast symmetrical courtyard of Changgyeonggung Palace. The film is called The Throne in English. In Korean, it is called Sado. A Korean-speaking audience would be presumed to know in advance who Prince Sado was. Oh, I'm, let me back up. If anyone here is sensitive to anti-Asian slurs, uh, I invite you to, I will not be at all hurt. If you cover your ears, leave the room, do whatever you need to do to take care of yourself. Um, let me start over. Detail of the rice chest. In the 2015 Korean film, The Throne, the rice chest sits in the center of the vast symmetrical courtyard of Changgyeonggung Palace. The film is called The Throne in, in, in English. In Korean, it is called Sado. A Korean-speaking audience would be presumed to know in advance who Prince Sado was. An English-speaking audience is presumed not to have this knowledge. Although this is a historical film, for a Korean-speaking audience, the well-known story functions as mythology at the level of symbol. For an English-speaking audience, the unknown story functions as narrative at the level of plot. There is an I in this poem. I know who Prince Sado is. I can read the Hangul word Sado, but I do not speak Korean. I'm a member of the English-speaking audience. I know about Prince Sado from the memoirs of Lady Hyegyong, 1804, but I know about the memoirs of Lady Hyegyong from Margaret Drabble's The Red Queen, 2004. Margaret Drabble's The Red Queen is about Lady Hyegyong, but Lady Hyegyong was never a queen, nor is she associated with the color red. The name is misleading. The name of the film, The Throne, <clears throat> is also misleading. The film does not focus on the throne, it focuses on the rice chest. Like a magnifying glass, the stone courtyard focuses the gaze on the rice chest. The gaze increases in intensity and heat. July temperatures in Seoul average 84 degrees Fahrenheit with average humidity of 78%. I have been to Seoul in July. I have worn hanbok on a summer day, but only once. I have never seen a rice chest. The rice chest is a functional object and stands in contrast to the highly decorative architecture of the palace courtyard. Its plainness renders it inscrutable, impenetrable. Because of its oversized lid, the rice chest appears top-heavy, charged with kinetic potential. On its four small feet, it seems to be crouching on its haunches to be hunkering down. Hunker down is a Scottish term that refers to squatting on the balls of one's feet, low to the ground but in readiness. It implies an apprehensive stasis, tense with the potential for sudden movement, poised to flee or to attack. I have hunkered down, but only once. Midway through the film, the rice chest is bound with thick rope, with a knotted webbing of four or five thicknesses of coarse, fibrous rope. The quantity of rope exceeds the function of the rope to such an extent that the rope binding seems decorative, symbolic. I have been bound with rope, but only once. There is something almost comic about such an excess of rope to bind a single imprisoned and dying man, the way there is something almost comic about a circle of guns pointed at a single unarmed man. I say almost comic rather than actually comic, because although these images provoke the same pent-up tension as suppressed laughter, I do not know who would find either of those images funny. After it is bound, the lid of the rice chest is heaped with grass. For a Korean-speaking audience, the grass-covered rice chest would resemble a traditional grassy burial mound, would evoke ancestral tombs, or even the prehistoric dolmens, which feature massive rocks perched on four small feet. 
I have seen the grassy burial mounds of my ancestors, but only once. For me, the rope-clad, grass-covered rice chest resembles a barbarian idol. According to the online etymological dictionary, the word barbarian comes originally from the Greek, meaning any non-Greek, but under the Romans, barbarian took on a derogatory connotation, those who speak a language different from one's own. When I say barbarian, it means I find the rice chest foreign, inscrutable, although it is Korean. Koreans speak a language different from my own. In the film, the walls of the rice chest are made of thick planks with chinks between them that admit slim shafts of light, drips of water. But the walls of Korean rice chests are made of solid panels of wood. Planks with chinks between them would admit pests, especially insects, into the rice chest. Such a rice chest design would not be functional. Partway through the film, we see a multi-legged insect enter the rice chest through a chink between the boards. We here refers to both the English-speaking and Korean-speaking audiences. The single insect is followed by a horde of identical multi-legged insects wriggling through the chinks in the walls. We understand the insects to be a hallucination of the dying Prince Sado. Their function is symbolic, the danger of allowing chinks in the walls. In the film, through the chinks in the walls, Prince Sado is able to see and to speak to his dog and to his 10-year-old son, the grand heir. But in fact, these incidents never took place. They are not hallucinations, but fabrications of the filmmakers. Just as the multi-legged insects, the chinks in the walls of the rice chest are fabrications of the filmmakers. The chinks allow the gaze to penetrate what would otherwise be impenetrable to penetrate the inscrutable, barbaric figure of the rice chest, to reach the human inside. In A Midsummer Night's Dream, which is familiar to both Korean and English-speaking audiences, Tom Snout, a rude mechanical, plays the part of a wall that features a crannied hole or chink. The joke is that a human being portrays an inhuman object, since only an inhuman object would feature such a chink. I do not know who would find this joke funny. When asked to show me thy chink, Tom Snout holds up two fingers. I have seen boys hold up two fingers. Calling me a chink, they would place their two fingers at the corners of their eyes, stretching their eyes into narrow slits through which it must have been difficult to see. They found this joke funny. I have seen men hold up two fingers. They would use their tongues to penetrate the chink between their fingers, rendering the gesture obscene. The tongue thrust between the fingers reads as sexual, whereas an outthrust tongue without the fingers would be merely rude. Neither gesture is intended to be funny. Both the boys and the men would use their two fingers to symbolize my body, a body that, without a chink, might seem impenetrable. The primary meaning of the English word chink is a split or crack, a narrow fissure or valley. It is related to the old German root germ, as in germinate, the connection being in the notion of bursting open, as the online etymological dictionary explains. Chink also has a racially derogatory meaning, referring to a Chinese person, or by extension to any East Asian person, since an English-speaking person using a racially derogatory term would not be expected to differentiate among East Asian people. I have asked boys to differentiate among East Asian people. Upon being called a chink, I would say, you're so stupid, I'm not a chink, I'm a gook. <laughs> the Korean-American comedian Margaret Cho later used a similar statement as a punchline to a joke. I find this joke funny, and some members of a Korean-speaking audience might find this joke funny. I do not know whether other members of an English-speaking audience would find this joke funny, but now I do. <laughs> the term guk was used by English-speaking soldiers to refer to Korean people during the Korean War. It was later used by English-speaking soldiers to, re to refer to Vietnamese people during the Vietnam War, since English-speaking soldiers do not differentiate among East Asian people. The term guk uh, might derive from the Korean word for American, miguk. Hearing Korean people say this word, English-speaking soldiers thought the Korean people were calling themselves guks, mi guk, and followed suit. The word miguk in Korean literally means beautiful country. Miguk is a transliteration of the Chinese characters me guo, which also mean beautiful country. 
I know how to pronounce miguk, but not miguo. There are several accounts of why miguo came to mean American. Some claim it's a simple phonetic approximation. Others claim that miguo was selected out of several possible phonetic approximations by 19th century American missionaries and then made official in the 1901 Boxer Protocol after Chinese de China's defeat by eight Western nations. I do not know which account is true. All commentators seem to agree that neither Korean people nor Chinese people literally believe that America is a beautiful country. <laughs> but both Korean people and Chinese people must call America beautiful in order to speak its name. Neither Korean people nor Chinese people refer to themselves as gooks or chinks. Neither Korean people nor Chinese people refer to themselves as Korean or Chinese. Korea is an English word that seems to derive from a mispronunciation of the name of the Koryo dynasty by Silk Road traders and was first recorded by Marco Polo. China is an English word that seems to derive from a mispronunciation of the name of the Qin dynasty by Silk Road traders and was first recorded by Marco Polo. I have said Marco Polo's name many times in a game that requires you to say his name many times. I do not know the origin of the game. Because of the R's and L's, Marco Polo would be a difficult name for Korean speakers to say, but I am not a Korean speaker. I have called myself a gook many times. I have called myself a chink only once, when a white high school friend used the term in conversation, then stopped, realizing her gaffe. Don't worry, I said, I know what you mean. X is such an FOB. What's an FOB, she asked. Fresh off the boat, I said. I may be a chink, but at least I'm not an FOB. We laughed together to relieve the tension, although I do not think either of us found my joke funny. I used the term FOB to show that I considered X to be foreign, a barbarian. I called myself a chink to make myself seem more American. Fresh off the boat was my white husband's fa favorite television show during the time when we were married. When we watched it, I hoped that laughing at the pushy Chinese immigrant mother on the show would lessen his dislike of my pushy Korean immigrant mother. I hoped that allowing my white husband to treat my parents as endearingly foreign, fresh off the boat, like the endearing, endearingly foreign TV family of fresh off the boat, would make myself seem more American. None of the actors in fresh off the boat are fresh off the boat. All of them were born in America. By pretending to be foreign, they make English-speaking audiences feel more American. My parents are not fresh off the boat. They have been in America for over 50 years. They speak both Korean and English. A television is a box that allows us to put people inside it. The television is sometimes called an idiot box from the Latin for private person, from idios, meaning one's own. But those inside the box have no privacy. We put the inscrutable into a box so they may be scrutinized. I made X inscrutable. I put X into the box. I made my parents inscrutable. I put my parents into the box. I decorated the box so it seemed foreign, barbaric. I made the box inscrutable so it seemed like a distant ancestor. I buried it so it seemed like a grave. I made a chink in the box that the gaze could penetrate. I stayed outside the box. I treated what was inside the box as a joke. I was the English-speaking audience. I watched Fresh Off the Boat on the Idiot Box. I watched The Throne on the Idiot Box. In The Throne, a parent puts his son in the rice chest. After the son's death, the rice chest is forced open. After the son's death, his mouth is forced open. Three spoonfuls of rice are forced into his mouth, rice that might have kept him from starving to death in the rice chest. After the son's death, a name is forced into his mouth. The name is Sado, a name which has meaning for Korean-speaking audiences. I have said Sado's name many times. The son never called himself Sado. There was never a chink in the rice chest. No one could see into the rice chest. There is a you in this poem. You are a member of the English-speaking audience. I let you see into the box, into what is private, into what is foreign, into what is inscrutable, into what has been buried. I am the chink in the box. Thank you.
Smokey. Sigurd.